Okay, welcome to my talk, everybody. Managing our external APIs and enterprise systems. My name is Pete Muldoon. I work in, uh, in Bloomberg. All right, so I'm a senior engineering lead in Bloomberg again. So who am I really? Well, I started using C++ a long, long time ago, right? 1991, back in the old days when we had a Seafront uh, transpiler. My professional career has been more or less as building large scale transactional systems and an architect of those. I did 21 years as a consultant and the last decade or so I've been in Bloomberg and right now I'm working on what they call the ticker plant migration, which is where we take all the data from exchanges around the world and feed them out in those tickers that you see in the terminal. So what do I do when I come to a conference and give a talk? I like to have my talk focus on what I call the practical side of software engineering, not the theory. It's based in the real world. It's usually on some real world system or problem I've come to solve. I like to demonstrate the applied principles. I do that through code. The code though is always, I believe, secondary. I'm trying to say, look at the principle and be able to apply it to your own code. And hopefully you can take something away with it and be able to use it in your own day-to-day -day activities. Not like, well, that was great, Pete, and now I'm gonna go off and do something that never uses that again, right? So it's to try and take something away with you. If you have questions, there's slide numbers in the bottom corner, the bottom right-hand corner, and that's just easier for me to get to a slide if you have particular questions, right? So I do take questions as we go along. So where is this talk going? What's it gonna be about? I know you've read the abstract, but what it's gonna really be about is using APIs. So that's the key word, using, not creating. And we're gonna talk about using abstractions to channel good practices, right? And not only channel good practices with APIs you're given, but also be able to absorb change in a, in a system and be able to mitigate risk when you're putting it into production. So the focus will be handling change in a live production system with reduced risk. It's critical that we don't take production down. And like I say, this talk is rooted in the real world. So this is a real problem I had. Let's talk about enterprise systems, which are large scale systems. So they usually go out of beyond one team. We use many APIs when we drag an application together. We don't want to write all the code ourselves. Right, so we have APIs that encapsulate our interaction with the database. We can have APIs for caching, we have APIs for IPC, so we can communicate with the external world and send our side effects out and get data. And also for blocks of functionality. And that's just what I'm talking about there. We persist state in our system. We get other information our system doesn't have or what's sent into us is not involved in it. And then we have them side effects propagated outside the system. So let's talk about APIs for a second. And there's been quite a few talks here on APIs. I supposed to give mine yesterday. But when I go to do a talk on a topic, I wanna to see what's out there. So I'm not covering the same old ground or at least I'm taking a different take on it. And I went out and said, what's going on with APIs and conference talks, right? And something like this comes out. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's pretty much creating APIs. What's the design principle for APIs? Uh, how do you make the best API? And uh, even at this um, one here, you see near the bottom, building interfaces by Andre Weiss, an API design principles by John, who's sitting right here in the audience. So we have a lot out there about creating those APIs, not so much about using them or controlling these APIs. I mean, if you're creating all these APIs, who are you creating from them for? Uh, someone like me, that's who's dragging large systems together. So let's have a very quick trot. Like I say, this will not be exhaustive. What is good API design? And I'm going to say when you're designing APIs, you're on the producer side. You're creating something for something else, for someone else. And I think some of the key things I look for in API is that it has general use and it's flexible. That means I can use it in a wide variety of applications, right? And it has many available modes of operation. And that's because I want my software to be used widely so people pay for it, or at least it gets you know, it gets very popular and I'm well known. So it has to have a lot of variability and flexibility. We also these days hopefully want an API that's testable, lots of dependency injection, and has good ergonomics, which is the phrase good to use, uh, easy to use, hard to misuse. All right, so these are some of the things I would look for in an API when I'm dragging it in to my enterprise system. What about the good use of APIs? In other words, I'm on the consumer side here and dragging them into the application. What am I looking for? 
Well, I'm looking for more something like this. I want specific use cases. I want specific outcomes. I do not want an API using 10 different ways to do the same thing, nine of which are probably not great. Okay, so I want to be able to constrain my API. All right, and then I also want to do things like code efficiency and bundling. But if you look at the top two bullets on each side of this, they're going the opposite way. Right, one's saying make it as general as it can, and as an API user, I want it specific. Right, so how do we bridge that gap normally? Well, unless we write the API with our own team, so it's very fitted to the use case, we use a wrapper abstraction. We use something to take that and make it work for us in the way we want it to work. And that's what we're going to look at today. So let's talk something like a transactional system that I worked on. And what happens is I have all these users sending actions in, do trades, split trades, cancel trades. And there, the action comes in, and it doesn't have all the data. I don't know who this guy is, what his accounts looks like. I'll go to other systems, pull in referential data, create a complete universe of information about this transaction that needs to be done. Is it valid? I'll mutate the state, and then I'll save it to the database. And the effects that go out to other systems or other parties, in my case, eventually down to the DTC, right, goes out through some kind of, I don't know, I.O., I will call it, right? Now, the thing about the systems, certainly the ones I work on, is they're generally part of a pipeline, right? In other words, my output is someone else's input. And similarly, I may be taking my input from someone else's output, which means I am chained into other systems' changes, problems, right? And I have to deal with that in a way that my system stays reliable and flexible and mostly maintainable. So if I look at this full system here, I'm going to take just a slice of it, right, where we're going to say that in, in the system I have, I have a request that's going out to a service A. I can't use the real names, right? Uh, Bloomberg won't let me. But we send a request to a, a, a server, right? And we get a response back saying how well that, that did. And depending on how well they did, the state change will, will stick. Or we send back to the user the, re the response to his action was successful or not, right? So I'm just going to take this slice of the system here. Now, the system that I am going to be talking about here is a system that was meant to be high throughput. It's called EMSX in Bloomberg. It's a large trading system. And we need a huge amount of throughput. And the old system wasn't giving us that throughput. It was starting to lag. So we developed our own coroutine library because boost fibers weren't available. So what happens is when actions come in from the outside, they're given to what's called an, uh, you know, uh, an ex executor reactor who spins up a coroutine. They just put on a, on a long queue. And the active threads in the system will service those. So we can have 50,000 coroutines in flight, but actually there's only however many threads of execution we have that's actually going on. But none, the threads are never idle unless there's no work in the system. And I'll get back, you'll see why that's important later. So in Bloomberg, I have an API. It's called something else, right? Starts with BAS. But I'm just going to call it a comms API for readability. And what it is, is it's templated on a request and a response type. So request, you put in all the data you need, to, what operation you want done, what data you need, the handles on it. You send it out, and you get a response back. And that's another defined structure. All right. So there is a very broad API here. We have um, send one way, which means just send it to someone. I don't care if they get it or not. Send it one way with ACK, meaning send it, and it'll let me know you got it, but I don't care what you did with it. We have the more common ones here, which is send a request. The blocking is the first one. We send a request, and we wait and block till we get a response back. And then we have the asynchronous version of that, where you say, let me send it. You get a bool back whether it succeeded or not. And what happens is you give it a functor, which has a very certain parens interface. And if it's a functor, it gets copied. I think you can also use a function pointer. We usually use functors. But the one thing to note about the API is it gives you back a piece of managed memory with the response in it. Right? It gives them what's called a managed pointer because we didn't have unique pointers in the language at the time. So they made something roughly equivalent themselves. So this is the external API I've been given, and I want to constrain that in my system. Yeah, so there we go, the two sounds. So I need to do a wrapper. 
All right, I'm saying, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, template it on request response, because a lot of different, I'm not doing it for one or two requests. There's all kind of requests in my system, and this allows me to genericize the code. But what I need is, what's my requirements going to be? What engineering decisions am I going to make in my use of this API? So I'm going to have some requirements. I like to get requirements that stops me going to strange places. So one of the requirements is the data potentially is very large that comes back. So what I want to do is make sure it's not copied, or at least not inadvertently copied. So it's going to be move only. If you need to copy it, you can do it, but you'll have to work hard at it. You won't be able to do it just by accident. And the second thing is I want a non-blocking send, right? So let's talk about the first thing. So I have a send here. And I want the response to be not copyable. So I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to put the response in here. How would I do this? How would I make the response? Now, I, by the way, the, this response and request are generated in another part of the company controls it. I have no ability to say, generate me move only requests. Right? So I have to constrain it externally. How would I do it here? I don't want response to be copyable. Anyone know? Come on, you guys are at a comp. What? Delete the copy, delete the copy constructor or make it private if you're in legacy code. That's one way of doing it. So I'll delete the copy constructor. Now I got to create move constructors because, you know, or at least bring the defaults back. And the defaults probably won't work because they'll try and copy. And then what happens when uh, the object goes out of scope? I got to write a destructor to make sure I delete that memory. Right, so what I'm getting into the rule of three, the rule of five, the rule of one, it's like you got all confused, you probably do it wrong, right? Even the best of us. So that is a way to do it, but I would contend that's not the good, a good engineering decision. What other way could you do this? What do we have in C++ standard that allows us to manage memory? Hmm? Unique pointer. Unique pointer. Right, so I put one, instead of writing a bunch of code on how to handle memory myself, and probably do it wrong, I just use a unique pointer. Unique pointer already has that done. You can't copy it. And because that is transitive, if I try and create a response carrier, it's not going to work. It's going to give me a compile error, so no inadvertent copies. So I'm going to go down here and change that to a response, carry, a response carrier that's going to carry whatever the response is. What about non-blocking sends? What would I do here? Now, people would say, oh, you could put a callback in there, which is what we have in the underlying API, but we kind of don't do things that way anymore. What do we use for asynchronous operation? Coroutines is a way of doing it, but I'm not going to return a coroutine here. What would I return? What do we use for futures? Yeah, future promise, right? So all I'm going to do is say it's a future. So the send will come back immediately. And only when I go to get the value out of that will it either block or if the value's there, get it back to me. All right. So we've made some design decisions on the API. and We've constrained it in a way that I think is going to work better as far as the whole system being more efficient. So now I'm going to write my application using this service. So I have a service.h file. I'm going to put this service here. Remember I told you it has a request and response here. So I'm going to template it on it. In my main, I'm going to create that service A. And I'm going to do it in main because if you start working with coroutines, you're going to start running into lifetime issues. So I'm going to create this in main. I'm going to spin up the coroutines. And when I shut things down, they're going to be spun down. And then when we exit main, the service is going to go away. So it's guaranteed to be there. Right? The state will be held in the futures, not in the actual service itself. Error handling. How am I going to handle errors here? Well, it's not how I'm going to handle, but I came in on the system, not at the very beginning. I came in when it was on. They decided to do the error handling in a way that if there's a problem, it'll throw an error. So we'll throw an exception. Otherwise, it doesn't throw, and that's how we check for errors, right? I'm not a huge fan of this. I have another new talk called Exceptionally Bad, which talks about doing things with exceptions you shouldn't. But that's a different talk. But this is what we were doing, and I was like, I can live with this. I might complain a little, but I can live with this. Now, on the left-hand side is all these files that are single files. But on the right, I have all kinds of actions. 
create this type of trade, modify this type of trade, cancel this, split this, hundreds of actions, right? And new, new ones being added every week. So I have hundreds of these files, and what I'm doing is I'm putting a service A reference in there. I'll just initial it with a service A. When it comes to do the action on these, I'm going to have this request that I need to populate. I'm going to go and do all kinds of manipulation of data, pulling data in, and eventually uh, fill this request with real information. And then I'm going to call the service we just designed with the request and get the future. All right. Then I'm going to ask for the future to give me the result. Right? And then I'm just going to check that that result, because I got to get inside the result is that unique pointer, right? The res pointer, dereference it. Anyone any questions on this? Some people might have a question in that I get a future and I immediately resolve it, right? Some people are nodding now. Now, it doesn't sound too fan out or too, uh, uh, you know, that we're getting a lot of a concurrency. But remember, this action is in a coroutine already. And when it hits here and we say get and it's not there, it's put on a queue, waiting for its promise to be filled. And we pick another coroutine off the queue that's either ready to be resumed, or if there's nothing ready to be resumed, we'll take a new one. So we have all these in flight, so we still have all that paralleling. Yes? What? You could try using it. We didn't have them at the time, I don't think. So we, did, we didn't go down with the asynchronous task. And the problem with the asynchronous task is it's based on the blocking of threads. And if you block a thread, that's debt in a coroutine system, right? Because I have, let's say, eight cores. So I have eight active threads running. If I use a regular mutex in a coroutine, what's it going to do? It's going to put that thread to sleep. I mean, it never does any work until it's woken up. And maybe you have 5,000 requests. What happens if you get thousands and thousands of threads in your system? You take it down, right? So you, you can't use the regular primitives to put, that put uh, uh, things to sleep. So an asynchronous async task won't work here. But I will have Godboat listing, so you can, if you want to make that work and come to me later, you can. I'll be very interested. All right. So let's talk about testing. All right, how am I doing on time? OK, so let's talk about testing, right? Because um, I'm a big proponent of testing. It's one of the main things I make sure gets done. Uh, so what I'm going to do is we're going to do Google Mock. So I'm going to just inherit off the base, which will be whatever the service is. In our case, it's service A. I'm going to, just going to drag the response and carry down, make it e we're at a using statement, make it easier to use. And then I'm just going to have the same send on this, which is takes a request and returns a future carrier. Now. Remember earlier I told you I made the data hard to copy. Well, this is where it bites me a little, right? Where I can't just copy the data from, you know, back out. So I just have a const method that returns a pointer to a future, and then I dereference it. So all of this is just getting around the, the, uh, the lack of copying, right? And you'll see now when we use it how we just use a local variable anyhow. So this is the service. Now, if you look at my action handler here, you see service A, look at the line on the bottom. When I'm going to create a test, I'm going to put a, I'm going to initialize it with a mock service. So what's going to happen when I call future.get? Oh, sorry, service.send. This thing here. What's it going to call? I'm going to call the service A. It's going to call the, right? It believes the type is a service A, so it's going to call it. So I got to go here and put a virtual. Now, some people say, oh my God, you're dynamically looking at something. Look, if this was a problem, there are tricks for static polymorphism. I would use them. But this was not an issue. It's the simplest way to do it. Let's do it that way, and I'll change it if it needs to be changed. So now we have testing. So here's the handler now. I'm going to make a fixture, which just means I'm going to inherit off the, the test, the, the Google test. You see I have the mock service being created on service A. I'm going to initialize, initialize the handler with it. And the execute function, this is just going to call handler.execute. All right, so the thing to realize about this kind of um, functionality is if this was, I don't know, uh, double something, I could say, look, I'm putting this in. Let me see what comes out. Is it double? But here, most of the action is going on in the request that's going out, right? And that's something that's 
normally hidden. And I certainly don't want to send the test out to a real life system. So what do we do? I want some dependency injection there. I want to be able to look at the request. It's got all the, all the manipulation of state and values is going to go into the request as it goes out. So what I'm going to do is, just like I say here, we have an expect call. So the first three lines is just setting up the request, building an action, the kind of action I'm looking to test on, and then giving me something, a, like I say, a unique pointer to a future of the carrier so I can return it as part of my mock, right? And then we'll see we have an expect call, which says service A is going to have the on send call down in the guts of the handler. And then here, we're going to save the request to the local variable. Right? What, what that means is all the logic that went into creating that request is going to be popped out here with the results, and I can check it. On this one, I've built a poor action, so I've tripped the check response. So here, I'm expecting a throw. Right? The same thing can be done here where we say, look, I'm going to build a real request. You'll see that I do the same send, except this time I'm not expecting a throw. And now I can ask, hey, is the quantity in that thing too? Because that's what the action said it should be. And you can also do things in, mock, in um, unit testing where we'll say you can do what's called, I guess, white box testing. You can reach under the curtain. Here they had special functions to reach into the cache and the state machine to look at that, that the transaction was properly formed. Right? But this gives you full testing right, of these handlers. And I'm going to put this into production. And it did go into production. Any questions up to now? So up to now, we've set the stage, right? We've constrained an API, we've built our service, put it into production. So in production, time goes by. Right? But change is in the air. And unless you have a dying system or a system that's going to be deprecated, you will face change. And I think uh, Ben said this morning, change comes at you fast. Right. So this went in, was in a couple of years, and then a big requirements change came in. And remember, we have more and more clients work on our system, so we're transitioning off the old system. It's not a toy or a test or a starting system. Now it's a system that has real users that are using it, expecting it to be up. So we get a change that comes in and says, service A is now to be replaced by service B. Because it's more direct, it has better throughput, better latency, less points of failure. It comes in with a whole smorgasbord of goodies. And we have to use it when to get rid of the old one. You know, but the service B is it has to be built out a little. It's, it's an existing service, but it hasn't got quite what we need, but they're going to build it out. All right, so it is a little experimental. So what I'm looking to do graphically is I'm looking to say, look, I'm going to put in a service B. It's going to return a completely different response and get rid of service A. Right? That getting rid of service A, by the way, is something you should be doing as engineers, not leaving that part out. Right? I go into many code bases, and I have to take big chunks of legacy code out for no reason. So why is, this, why is this here? Is anyone using it? I don't think so, but we're afraid to take it out. Right? Because someone didn't do the plan proper decommissioning. All right, so now I'm going to do a straight swap. All right, look, you got me a big change? Watch me go. All right, look, first, completely different response. So I'm going to have to write a new check response. The fields are separate, probably have separate values. And all I'm going to do is service A, I'm going to change that to service B's. And then in my action handlers, my you know, 200 action handlers, just change those guys to service B as well. All right, get rid of the check response for service A, for response A. Wow, I am done. Right? And am I going to get a good review next time it comes around? OK. I don't see any problems with this. I've absorbed a huge amount of change. Completely different service, completely different response. Does anyone see problems with this? Hmm? No, no, no. The, the, the lots of logic is very different, right? So it's not just a string saying lots of logic. There's tons of different stuff. OK, so look, well, to me, this approach is risky. I push this into production. Boof, Stuff goes down. I'm like, oh, OK, you know, revert all that code back. I'm sorry. And they go, well, you're reverting 10 other 
production critical changes when you do that. So that's not really a good way to do it. Right, so the new servers may be unproven in a lot of cases. Here it was pretty proven. But your interactions between your application and service B are definitely unproven. Now, if you do an all or nothing, like push all the chips in and send, send it into production, you're, uh, uh, you got more risk tolerance than I have, right? And probably a shorter career. Okay, so this is out for me. I can't use this. I won't be allowed to use this, rightfully so. If you have a system where you can take a few shots, you know, push it in, all right, pull it out. I think I fixed it, push it in again. My case going down, you eventually get it working, you know, two months later after 15 pushes. Then you can do this way, and it's maybe that's part of your ethos, but I can't do it that way, right? If I take the mark, if I take transactional systems down, you know, reputational damage, financial problem. You know, people are going to say, hey, you owe us money, you messed up our trade, so I can't do it. So what I have to do is a phased approach. And what that means is I'm going to, for a period of time, have both systems running. I'm going to have a small routing function that's going to say, in the very beginning, I push out all the code. Service B is doing nothing. Then it takes some small test clients, maybe, and start routing their stuff there. If there's a problem, I can fix it, route them back, fix it, route them in, right? It's a dynamic piece. And over time, all the traffic that's in service A migrates to service B. And then I can just get rid of service A whenever I'm done. Right? Much more, much more mitigation of risk. So if I want to do it this way, let me do it the brute force way. Right? So let's say, look, I'll just double everything. Service A, service B, create it new check response. This is okay on the left because it's only one line and three files, let's say. On the right in my hundreds of files, I'm gonna say, look, well, I gotta use the service B now sometimes. So I gotta put that in all these classes. And I gotta put a route function that says, look, if you route it one way, then you know, do it through service A, and if you route it the other way through service B. What do people think of this as a, an, an approach? I have one guy shaking his head. Like, show of hands who likes it. Show of hands who doesn't like it. All right, so no one here seems to like it. Do you know why you don't like it? All right, here's a bunch of problems I'm gonna point out, right? Problem number one is, what's going to happen when I do decommissioning? I'm gonna to have to throw all this other code out, right, across hundreds of files. Right, so that's problem one. It's all throwaway code I'm writing. Problem two is that I'm putting branching in hundreds of files. Now, how long do you think this change is going to take? Right, for me to shift all the traffic from A to B gradually, and then say everything is done, I can get rid of service A. What kind of timeline do you think we're talking about there? All right. It was two years, right? And it's only lately I can say that, right? It's two years. The last guy that had real problems, they had to get him to sign a, to sign a legal contract to say he was okay with it, right? They were so nervous about it. Right, so over time, what's going to happen now, in two years, hundreds of files with this branching, people are gonna make changes in one branch, not in the other. And you don't know, was it deliberately left out because it doesn't apply to the new way we're doing things? Did someone just, not bother because it was going through that piece of the code. And in the end, you'll have a, it'll be riskier to decommission this thing than it was to put the new service in, right? Now, if I have no intention of decommissioning this, this is fine, right? If I'm just gonna say, jam it in and walk away, then yeah, I guess you can get away with this. It's someone else's problem, right? But it's not a nice thing to do, right? So let's go and say brute force is not, doesn't work for me either, right? Not because people were telling me I can't do it, I just think I should not be doing it. So let's think in a different way. Let's think of the full migration path. Instead of just getting things in, getting things in and taking the other thing out. So again, as I say, I like to do requirements to see what I need. And to me, what the requirements are is I need localized the meaningful changes. Anything that's dealing with the second service should be localized in one, two, just a couple of files, not across hundreds of handlers, right? And by the way I do that is keeping the global usage unchanged. 
So all the contracts I have with all the handlers remains unchanged. Okay, and that means that I don't have sweeping changes throughout my system. That's going to minimize throwaway work, and it's going to make the final decommissioning simple, and because it's simple, it's going to make it a lot less risky. Okay, but watch out for unit testing, because unit testing took me a lot more time than actually converting over the whole service. Right? And by that, I mean getting it to compile. Right? It's got a large amount of code. It's less constrained. You can do all kinds of dodgy practices and unit testing to reach under the curtain and do all kinds of shifty stuff that would never go on in production. And the mocks give you additional semantics to worry about. So if I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to do it iteratively with you, I'm going to say, look, my service A, right? I'm just going to change it with a service proxy. All right? So it's still going to be a service-like object. And my check response, instead of taking the response from service A, is going to take the response wherever the proxy gives me. Right? On the other side, right, all I'm going to do with all my handlers is say, and I'm going to start on one first. Right? I'm not going to just, I don't flash the whole code base at one shot. Right? I'll do it once, and then I'll do it in the rest of the code base. So I'm going to take a, a, the handlers and just change the service A to a proxy and rename the variable. Right? Important. Any IDE will handle this. I use Eclipse. I just say change the type, change the name, and it does it everywhere in the code it needs to be done. And then down where I call the send, I'm just going to call the proxy send. This looks very similar to what we had, right? I've just changed the name and the type, but the calling conventions and contracts are all the same. OK, so what is a service proxy? I don't even know what it is. I have some idea what its behavior is supposed to be, so let me start building a service proxy. Okay, what do I need inside of this proxy? Anyone? No, what members do I need? What members do I need? I, know. I need a service A and B because I'm going to call these two guys, right? If I had a C, I'd put it in there as well. And then I'm going to need what? A send function, right? That looks, smells, and feels just like the one I'm replacing. So it's going to take a request. We have a routing, and it's going to return this thing called a var resp future. It can't return the same thing right, because I have multiple services involved. So what do people think this var resp future is? Well, you can tell it's a variant, right? Yeah, yeah. but what can this thing potentially uh, give me back? Yeah, whatever A and B sends give me, it's right there, right? So all it is is the future of either service A response or the service B. Right? Pretty neat. And what we have here is this service is acting pretty much like the other services. Right? I don't have any psychotic break on what's going on here. So I put this in and I go, compile. And when I do the compile, it comes up, there's no member name get invariant, which is true. There is a std get, but there's no get invariant. And that comes from here. So let's say the line before I do a service.send, that's the contract I fulfilled. I'm not. I'm not taking care of the contract after, which is the result future.get. And what does the get do? It resolves it from a future to an actual response. Right? So OK, so I got to create a result future. So it's a result on this variant. Right? So here's the variant we got back. What's my get going to do? Right. It's just going to say, look, did you get a service A future? or a service B future. And if you did, do a get on it. And then we're going to return a var resp future. Anyone know what that var resp future is going to be? It's just going to be one or the other, one of the other responses, because we've now resolved the future. OK. Now, if anyone's interested in what overload it is, because I'm using the visitor pattern, it's a simple variadic template class that you just, uh, yeah, there's me. Uh, here it is here, overloaded. All it does is you give it a bunch of lambdas, it inherits from them, and then you use visit, it calls a particular lambda, whatever argument that's there, right? We drag the paren functions down. The only difference here from what I think is in CP preference is I use a deduction guide to do move semantics instead of copies, right? Because, like I say, we don't do copies, and if you tried, you would have a problem. So again, now, I gave this talk originally a year ago, and some bright guy in the audience says, why aren't you using a generic lambda? I went, hmm, why aren't I using a generic lambda? The code's a lot tighter and I think a lot better. Anyone not like this? I mean, visit is nice. I think this is nicer. 
All right, so I say, listen, now I have a result future, right? Let's compile this thing. No member res pointer in stud variant of these two response carriers. Right, so where is that problem? That's down here. Right, so you see we're iteratively just filling the contracts, but when you read this, the service proxy.send sends a request, gets a future back. The get resolves that future, and I we want to say, listen, I want to check this response, but I have this problem down here. Now, if you don't, rem if you don't remember, we have a response carrier which has this unique pointer in. We're reaching in and dereferencing that, right? So now I got to build a result that can handle that particular contract, right? <laughs> Sorry, I have to laugh at this one. All right, so I have my var rest coming in. And all right, so the first thing that I do in that result at the bottom is I go for a member called res pointer. So I need a member called res pointer in there. So let me manufacture one, right? I need it, I have to tell it. I know, it's funny. Now then I gotta give dereference operators on that to give me back the response. This will now compile. Who thinks, who thinks I'm a very clever guy, right? Is this the way, yeah, you're wrong. Well, on this you're wrong. I think I am a little. So what's the problem here? The problem here is I'm solving the problem where it shows up, not where the actual problem resides, right? And the problem resides back here. In the choice that was made, that I made, I, well, I didn't really make, it was before I came to the system. The choice was made, let's just reach in and grab a member and dereference it, right? A better decision would have been to put an interface in that says get response. Okay, now all of this just goes down to a get response like this. Everyone okay with this? Hmm? There's a little thing in here that you probably won't notice, but I didn't notice it until I gave the talk a couple of times. So, all right, and now what, hap uh, now what happens, you see my check response at the bottom, instead of dereferencing a response pointer. It now says check response result dot get response. That reads a lot better, right? Which gives you a clue that the original interface was probably wanting. And now I have everything sorted out. I'm fulfilling all my contracts. This will work, right? I'm gonna do a send and it does it the same way. Like there's going to be other action handlers that are on a service and they're gonna do the exact same thing. Oh, I forgot to mention something, right? When I put this get response in, all right, into the original piece here, when I put the get response in, I opened up a new change, uh, a new PR, right, in the code base. And I said, look, I'm adding this member function here and everywhere else in the code, I'm changing this to get response. So there was a couple of hundred files, but people look at it and they see, he changed star res pointer to get response just over and over and over and over again. Yeah you got to look at where the result is. Right? And they go look and they go like, oh wow, you just added a get response on it. That's a safe change, even though it's over a lot of files. And it went in. And once it went in, I was able to drop all the craziness. And no one actually ever seen my psychotic way of doing it with all that dereferencing and stuff. It never actually made it into a code base. It's, it's only alive on these slides, right? So, because, you know, preserves the image. So what am I doing my error handling? I have a check response for A and B, and I have this variant of the responses coming back. So how am I gonna deal with that? Just with overwrites, right? I can use my original way, which is the way I did it, right? Or I could use the nice template lambda that someone told me about, right, to use it. And in fairness, when I wrote this, we were just moving on to 17. In fairness, right, so. Wasn't that I don't like them, I just wasn't familiar with them at the time. So now when a check response comes in, it's just going to be dispatched to whatever check response takes care of it. On my mock side, this is what I have as my mock service. I want to do testing on this. I just derive a mock service proxy. I cannot get rid of the top one because other services that are not mine, like service you know, XYZ is using this. It's a general part of the system, but I can add my own mock service proxy, and all does that does is do the same send. All right, just returns a different result future instead of uh, the carrier. So when I go to test this, all I got to do is my and my handlers, and again I use an ID to this. I do not do this my own. I just say to the ID, change every mock service 
uh, here to a mock service proxy, as you see, and then the, uh, the handler just takes the proxy. Right. Change the names of your code. Don't leave them as is. I wrote a piece of legacy code one time, and it had database. And I looked through the CPP, and it had database.send. Like, how can you send on a database? Turned out the internal used to be a database, but then they changed it to uh, an MQ. And they never, never renamed either the type or the opera, you know, so it looked like really strange. So rename them like this. Any IDE will do it for you. You don't have to do it yourself. So now look at the testing. So here's my original testing, right, where I'm doing the expect where I have a throw. All right. All I change is everything in red is the thing that changed. I just got to create a different um, result. That's what the response is. And the expect call is different just because I'm using a different name proxy. Everything else is the same. There was no change to the calling semantics here. When I want, that was the unhappy path. When I want to do the happy path, here's what it is. Again, watch what changes. Nothing actually on the green side changes. That all stayed the same. Excuse me. Because I kept the global contracts the same. How am I doing for time? 20 minutes. OK, good. Any questions so far? I realize I've been racing along here. OK. So this goes into production, right? And I have to say, without issue. Right? So it goes into production, no one's screaming. I then left the team to go work on, I think, even bigger problems. But I then left the team. <coughs> but Time still goes by in production, right? Time is the thing you're very hard to stop. And eventually, two years later, all requests are now routed through service B. OK. So it's time to do the decommissioning step. Now, for decommission, now remember, I'm not there to do the decommissioning anymore. It's someone else. However, the someone else is able to reason very clearly about what's going on and what needs to change. And he actually attended my talk on this, right? So before the decommissioning, I give this talk at the CPP con, and he came to the thing. And I asked him, where we where had we decommissioned it? Yes, he said, there's just one more guy. And I was like, so you're not there yet. He's not. So he said the decommissioning was simple. But here's the service proxy that I have. So service A is no longer used. Decommission, I don't know, let's call it stage one, is this. Strip out every, every service A. So I don't need a service A member anymore. My variant doesn't need a future for service A. I don't need any routing anymore. Anyone think we're done here? This is pretty neat. Right? It's a little odd to see a variant with one thing in it, right? Yeah. Right, so the question is, why don't I keep it in for service C? I can just put it back in one file, right? The route function will probably be different. It's going to look at something else, right? But even so, the, the route function took me 15, 20 minutes to write. That's really uninteresting. It's an array of numbers, and I push, pull a thing out with a request, this thing called a broker ID. And if it matches on that, I send it down service B. Otherwise, I don't. So it's a really trivial piece of code. So it's not worth keeping it around as tech debt. But the variant, who here has seen variants with one thing in it in code? Why is that? Who would do something like that? It's from template stuff. To me, it's because something used to be in there and was taken out. Right. And it's confusing. And I think the second level of decommission would be just doing something like this, right? Is, is get rid of the variant and just say my result future is the actual future that comes back. My send is just a send. So it's just a pass through now. Right. Now, this is, I'm going to say, a second level decommissioning. But we could do go all the way and rip this out and just have service B, raw service Bs again. Right. Who likes that idea? That's you? All right. Have you learned no nothing at this talk? <laughs> Have you learned nothing about change, <laughs> right? So um, when they told me they had finished the decommission, I went and looked at the code base, and I see the abstraction is still there, even though 
they could have taken it all out. And it's there because what does an abstraction do? It's also like a shock absorber for change, right? I took a lot of change, and uh, you know, through this service proxy, I was able, like, and if, as, as someone said, if a service C comes along or some new thing comes along, I can localize it in here or localize the use of some class, a free function in here, in one spot. So I think you leave these abstractions in. But let me give you a reality check and think like, if you think I just sort of solved toy problems in Bloomberg, what really was happening behind the scenes here is request A was actually a vector of request B, more or less, right? And when it went to service A, you got a future of all these responses coming back. And really it was some other service just sending stuff out, waiting for it to come in. It wasn't very, it was pretty synchronous, not reliable, and that's why we want to get rid of it, right? So we, when we go into the other way, which is the request B with the payload in it, we just sent out hundreds of these things if we needed to, right? We're doing uh, these things called batch routing. S send a bunch of uh, financial routes, and when they come back, they're all pushed together, and we resolve the future. If one fails, Right? We can cut short. We don't say we, need, we don't need to hang around for all the others to come back successful because one fail, all fail. You can't do that with the with the service A. Right? So so visually it looks like this. Our request A came into the proxy, went to the service A, right? It did all that interleaving of stuff. We did it with our coroutines much more uh, efficiently. Okay. So let's go back and recap. All right. So we were talking about API use, right, which I don't think gets a lot of airtime. And we talked about we need to take an API and we use a channel good practices with some abstraction constraints. And for ours, we did things like move only data, give it modern future promise semantics, and we gave us that layer of abstraction that could actually absorb change. All right. Now, when we go to do change, and this is something you should remember if you remember nothing else, right? When you're going to handle change, what requirements should you really be doing? You should localize meaningful changes, not have them spread all throughout your code base. Not only is it hard, there's two ways to get a really widespread change through, right, through uh, a code review. One is make it very simple, like I did with the get response. People can look at it, get it in their head, and say, this looks fine. The other one is to make it so complicated no one can understand it, and they go, okay, right? I don't like doing it the second way. Break your stuff down. Right? So localize meaningful changes. You also want to keep global usage or contracts the same. And that was the key. If I did not do that, I would have sweeping changes throughout my system that I would have had to undo. Except for meaningful improvements, and by that I mean stuff you're not going to throw out. So my get response broke the contract. It did, it broke it. I just took it, put a better thing in, and that better thing is not going away and hasn't gone away. So except for those, you want to keep the contracts the same. This allows you to minimize throwaway work and keep the final decommissioning simple. This actually got decommissioned. And I got decommissioned by someone who did not do it, because I did the changes. It got decommissioned by him who did not do the changes, right? And there was no fallout from it, okay? So what's the end game? Like, why am I up here? So by the way, the code here is secondary to the principle of keeping your global contracts, not having sweeping changes. And when you make changes, they're for the good and they stay permanent. But what was the end game? Why do this? I mean, we can probably get away with a pretty comfortable living doing it the brute force method and stuff like this, right? As long as we change careers every so often. All right. Is we want a better delivery of change, right? Lots of times you don't have a very good delivery of change, especially the more legacy system. And how do we do that? We do that by mitigating the production risk. And we mitigated it here by, like I say, having a phase transition and having the changes localized in one spot so people can understand what you're doing, right? And see it all in one spot. That is the end of the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, say, wow, well, I need to use inheritance. So I do, these are all the Godboat listings. You can go in, change them, and bring yourself and your laptop back to me, and we will look at it, right? Because I'm always interested in that stuff. Like I say, the templated Lambda was someone someone gave to me at a talk. I have other engineering talks, uh, all based on the real world, because it's where I ten, tend to code. 
All right, retiring the singleton pattern should not exist. Resi redesigning legacy systems and exceptionally bad, which is my latest talk, um, misuse of exceptions and how to do better. Uh, questions?